Bibles this morning, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 39. Um, Zach, I'm going to, can you move those that way? I got, I got to get on that board. Just give me a second here, um, and you can go to turn in your Bibles. I'm going to draw a, a chart, just something here to give you, give your eyes something to work with as I show you some stuff today. <coughs> I would have had this done earlier, but I didn't plan to do it, to, so bear with me. That's good. And you may want to do this on a piece of paper yourself, but I'm going to draw a line. And in the beginning of this line, and there's the, the line has, this, this is the history of life. It has a beginning and it has an end. We're going to call the beginning creation. And we're going to call the end the consummation of all things or conclusion, whatever, you know, the end, which is really the beginning. It launches, because this is, this is world history. After you get past this, you're launched off into eternity forever with Christ. So you've got a beginning and you've got an end, right? You see that? In the middle is Christ and the cross. That's the centrality of all history is Christ and the cross. Now, before this, this is called B.C. And you don't, this is nothing you don't already know, but I'm just trying to establish something here. From creation to the cross of Christ is B.C., meaning before Christ, um, and from Christ to the conclusion, the consummation of all things, is what we consider A.D. And that does not mean after death. I forget what the Latin is for that, but it doesn't mean after death. Um, now, up above this, I'm going to put the kingdom of God. Because it's what it's all about. God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So this is the kingdom of God. It has a beginning and it has... An end. And during this time from creation to Christ, pretty much so is Israel. And we call this the preparation of the gospel or of the kingdom. So from creation, this is all going to make sense. So from creation to Christ is the preparation of the kingdom of God. When Christ comes, and for especially the three and a half years, this is what we call the establishing of the kingdom. So here, from, from the B.C. time, from creation to Christ, is preparation of the kingdom. While Christ is ministering those 30-some years, especially three and a half, is Him establishing the kingdom. And from Christ to the end is... The, um, the reign of the kingdom, basically. So you've got the preparation, the establishing, and the, and the consummation of the kingdom. Three things I want you to see. The preparation of the kingdom, the establishing of the kingdom, and the conclusion of the kingdom. But from this point here to this point, and we're not going to be able to develop this at all, but I'm just going to drop it to you and see the format, is really the book of Revelation being played out right here from... The new covenant, actually, is what had happened at the resurrection, all the way to the end. And this is the church. Now, here's the big thing. Israel was part of the preparation. Christ comes and establishes the church, or establishes the kingdom, and then it goes to the church, which is one new man, Jew and Greek alike. Gentile, Jew. All one new man now. There's no Israel there's no ethnicity, there's no nation, it's one new man called the church, which is the body of Christ. And so now the kingdom of God is working through the church, not through the nation of Israel, because they had their time during the preparation. They, Christ came for the Jew, they rejected Jesus, 
And even if they did receive Jesus, that's still okay because he had one new man in mind. And so he was going to bring the Gentile and Israel, the Jew, together and create that one new man called the church, which is the body of Christ. This may not make sense to you. You may not care about it, but some do, and that's why I actually should care about it. Anyway, I ended last week, and we'll get back to that. I'm just creating that chart there so we can refer to it as I go through the message. We ended last week, and we were talking about the manifestation of the sons of God out of Romans 8. We ended last week about our responsibility or our, our benefit of the kingdom is that we get to rule and reign in this life. Now, in Matthew chapter 24, we, we see that Jesus gives us a parable of us being able to rule the goods. That's the benefits. That's our inheritance. Um, and in the sense, in the parable he uses is that the master has a house, and the, and the, and the servant gets the um, rulership over all the goods that are in that house. Well, in the kingdom are benefits. There's treasures. There's goods. There's blessings. And we are rulers over those goods in God's household. And then in Luke chapter 12, another parable says that we rule in the household. That can represent the church. Luke 19 talks about us ruling over cities. Now, have you ever stopped? I mean, you, you may be okay with ruling in a household, ruling goods, but now when you take it to ruling cities, it's like, oh, I don't know. That's where I, don't, I can't. I don't have enough faith for that. What does that actually mean? And most people throw it over into what we would call the millennium. You ever heard of the millennium, the thousand-year reign? That most of the church thinks it's literal. Actually, Jesus is going to come and set up a kingdom for a thousand years. And there is no, there is, that is not even um, scriptural. It's just a misinterpretation of scripture. It's a spiritual reign of the church, which I just showed you right here. Let me just say this, because I'm going to be referring, be referring to the millennium. But let's just deal with this real quick. Not developing it so much as just dealing with it. There's an end time view called dispensationalism that says there's going to be a rapture, a seven year tribulation, then the millennium, and then the battle of Armageddon, then the new heavens and new earth. It's supposed to happen between here and there. But that's not scriptural because the book of Revelation is something that's more spiritual. And it has, and it says that the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus, not end time events. And it says it right in the very beginning, chapter 1, verse 1. It's a revelation of Jesus, not tribulation, not antichrist. And and the fact that when John got this, he said he heard a voice behind him. <clears throat> Meaning that John has to turn back at what was accomplished on the cross, not what's going to happen in the future. The revelation of Jesus Christ cannot be saw or understood by looking at the future events of an antichrist and all that. The revelation of Jesus Christ has to look back to the cross, which is the central where he established the kingdom right here, the cross. So John's looking back at what the cross is all about, which is our victory in Jesus. And that's how we're going to be the overcoming church. Now, when you come over here, this is why I have it in all these instruments and it's like a little maze here. But <laughs> this is why I haven't erased any of this yet, because we're at this point here of the New Jerusalem, right here, seven spirits in the book of Revelation. This part here of all that, this part here goes between here and here. Okay? So, what dispensationalism does is, it, this is one age right here, from creation to the end, is one age. And then eternity, new heavens, new earth, the consummation of new Jerusalem, that's the other age. And there's only two ages that the Bible talks about. The one that you and I are living in now, that started the creation, and through Jesus, and all the way here in the church, to the end is one age, and then the other age is eternity, that's consummation of all things. Now, what dispensationalism wants to do is add another age. Stick it right here somewhere and call it the millennium that happens after the church is taken out, and then for seven years we're in heaven playing around while hell's breaking loose on earth, and then um, when all the enemy comes against Israel, which really shouldn't even be exist anymore, right? Because it was in the preparation mode. Now it should be the one man. I don't know why they want, they want to bring Israel back into the picture when the church is a fulfillment of the one new man with Israel and no Jew, no Gentile. Paul clearly teaches that. And so Jesus and us comes back for Israel during this time, battle of Armageddon, and then sets up 
um, the new heavens, new earth, or, or the, the, the millennium, millennial reign here for a thousand years. And I know you know this because this is what's predominant in Christianity today. But there is no third age. This makes it a third age here. So I'm saying that the thousand year millennial reign is what Christ accomplished on the cross for the church to rule and reign from this point to this point, which is that new Jerusalem, that graph over there, okay? And if you're new here, that ain't going to mean squat to you. So I'm just showing those who that would make sense to. Then he goes from goods, households, cities to ruling nations. Now see, end time says all that ruling that the Bible talks about is going to be in this thousand year millennial reign. And who in God's, we don't even know what's going to happen. So when you read scriptures like ruling and reigning, you throw it into the millennium. Not now. So you're not ruling and reigning now. But Paul says in Romans 5.17 that if we receive the gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace, we're going to reign in this life. Alright, so there's a reigning in this life. So what does that reigning look like? If, if, we're, if they're wrong, and I believe that they are, and I'm not the only one, there's many theologians that agree with what I'm saying to you, so it's not off the wall what I'm saying. And they're saying, in fact, this millennial, this, this millennial reign is spiritual is what's been believed by most of Christendom for years, and, and you know, especially with the among the Reformed and everything. So you take the millennial out, and it's a spiritual picture of the church ruling and reigning in this life, then we can now take the ruling and reigning scriptures and apply them today. If the millennial is today, spiritually, thousand just means an age for years and years and years until the final end. So that means that we've got to look at these scriptures differently and ask the question, are we ruling and reigning? Because he says, if I've received the gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace, I'm supposed to reign in this life. Goods, household, and what does it mean to reign cities and nations? What does that actually mean? Now, when Jesus says that you're the salt of the earth, that's supposed to be, salt's a, a, a preserving thing, right? It preserves stuff so it doesn't spoil. Well, the church in the world preserves the world from its going haywire into total wickedness. We restrain a lot of the evil in this world by being saved. Do you realize that your household has been restrained from evil because you got saved? If you didn't get saved, you'd let drugs in there, alcohol in there, all kinds of crazy stuff in your house if you weren't a saved person, right? So your household is saved, which is preserved from the evil that's in this world. Now God dispatches the church in the world as a kingdom. He calls us a kingdom. We are, we are a kingdom of kings and priests. He puts us in the world to preserve the world, and that means in that salt and light, we are ruling and reigning in this life. And I told you last week, the church is a sleeping giant, and we put more in the governments, and you know, it's like the United States is the superpower, but in reality, folks, the church is the superpower. You are the superpower. You know, when you, 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 you think that you're seeking signs and wonders or that signs and wonders are supposed to follow you, but the book of Isaiah says you are the sign and wonder. You've never seen yourself as a sign and wonder. You know why? Because you're going to go to a meeting to look for a sign and wonder. Well, you are the sign and wonder. So it's a matter of you getting the right lens, the right perspective of who you are in Christ and letting the kingdom of God that's within you, according to Luke 17, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you, and let that kingdom come out of you. And when it comes out of you, it's going to be rivers of living water that's going to bless the peoples, the nations. And that not that what Jesus or God told Abraham? That you were going to be a blessing to the families of the earth? The only way you're going to be a blessing to the, the church is going to be a blessing to this earth is if we rule and reign over um, principalities and powers and forces and all kinds of things that Paul talks about we wrestle against in Ephesians chapter 6. Now, I'm going to show you what the church is supposed to look like in the world here in Genesis 39. Look at verse 1. Now, Joseph had been brought down to Egypt. Remember, his brother sold him. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had brought him, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was what? With him. With him and that the Lord caused all that Joseph did to what? Prosper, Prosper or succeed. 
in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made Joseph what? Overseer. Overseer. Some translations will say ruler. Over what? His house and put him in charge of all that he had. Now this kid is some foreigner. And he's in Egypt and this, this, this not, not the king, not the actual prime minister Pharaoh, but one of his hirelings underneath that's a, a ruler over the people takes Joseph, puts him in the house because he sees that the favor of God is on him and whatever his hand touches prospers. He says, this is a blessed man. Because isn't what God told Abraham? You're going to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. We see right now Joseph is going to be a blessing to this wicked man in a worldly nation called Egypt. Right? And he's going to be put ruler over the house and ruler over all his goods. Now, read on. From the time that he made him overseer, that he made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house. See there? The blessing is on the Egyptian's house. Not because the Egyptian, he's, he's not even a godly person. It's because the presence of Joseph is in the Egyptian's house, and, he, and God blessed the Egyptian's house for what? Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. Since he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food that he ate. Now watch this. So if, if, if Potiphar said, I'm going to give you half of rulership, then half the blessing would have went to Potiphar. But when Potiphar said, look, there is no reason for me not to give you full ownership and rulership of all that I have, not so much ownership, but the rulership. So the more that, jo the more that Potiphar gave to Joseph to be in charge of, the more blessed Potiphar became. <clears throat> Even in the fields, not just in the household, but he said, hey, if you're, 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 you're prospering my house, I'm going to get you in charge of the fields. And then the fields began to prosper. Right? right? Now, watch. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. It's just a given. You're good looking when you get saved. <laughs> and after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. And he refused and said to his master's wife, now watch. Watch what he says to this woman. Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything. He has no concern about health care. He has no concern about the economy. He has no concern about terrorism. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house. There is no one greater in this house than I am but him. And he has not kept anything back from me except you. Now, why I say that is because he had been given everything. Joseph had been given everything, but of course the man's wife, right? He says, because you are his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now, I want to show you in this story, Joseph is a type of the church in the world. And Potiphar is the world rulers and the physical governing rule, if you would, and the house is the world. So we're in the world, but we're not of it. But if God has put the church in the world like he put Joseph in Potiphar's house, we don't need to be looking for, to the government for salvation, should we? Who should we be looking for? The body, which is the body of Christ, Christ being the head. So what are we doing sitting around waiting for the world to take the lead, for the world to find the answer when the answer is within you and me right now? Inside of us right now is the answer to every problem in your home, in your life, in your neighborhood, in your community, in your city, and in your nation. So when we go back to what does it mean to rule cities and nations, it means that we have stewardship over our communities. We have stewardship over our cities and nations that if the church would wake up and realize who they are in Christ and use the power and authority, the faith that God has given them, and and rule with the goods that we have in the household of God and be a blessing to the families of the earth, I'm t we, we wouldn't need anything. The world, the world wouldn't have any concerns if the church would rise up. Well, you really believe that? I do. 
Because if you look at the life of Jesus for three and a half years, anybody that walked around with Jesus had zero concern. Even at the point when Peter went to go to his mother-in-law's house, she just gets a fever. He, he, he takes care of the fever and the mother-in-law. And then what does she do when she gets better? She fixes him something to eat. The man had no need. And then when there were terrorist plots against him, right? Come on. Did they not want to kill Jesus? They led him to the cliff. And what's he do? He goes, walks right through them. And they didn't know where he went. He walks through them. That's ruling and reigning. And just look at the life of Jesus, and he's the head of the church. You're the body. He's the head. How's he going to function in this world today? Through you. How's God going to rule and reign today? Through you. You are the ruling and reigning factor of God in this world today. And we don't even know it. We don't even know it. We don't even do it in our own personal lives. We let the, let, we let the devil beat the hell out of us on every front in our personal lives because we don't know the dominion that we have. Seriously, it has to start at home. I mean, first it has to start with you, taking dominion of your life back. And then it, then it comes again out of, the, out of your belly of dominion and power and authority. The life of God, the oneness that she talked about this morning comes out of us. And we begin to take dominion over our own personal lives, our family, our homes. And then the church begins to take dominion in, in the world and so forth and so on. So, Genesis 20, now look at Genesis 39 verse 40. So the man believes his wife because she said he raped her. He wouldn't lie with her, right? You know the story. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. But the Lord was what? The Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison and the keeper of all the prison so he's, he's, getting, he's getting rulership again. I don't care where God puts us. In a pit or a pinnacle, you're ruling. Now get that. I don't care if you're in a shack, you're ruling. Or if you're in a mansion, you're ruling. Or if you're in Fairmont, you're ruling. You don't got to wait till you get to some L.A. to rule or New York. You know? You rule now. And, and it's not... I rule because I'm in this area. I rule because I have this much money. I rule because I have this IQ. You rule all the time because it's your inheritance to rule and reign. So it doesn't matter if he is at home with the boys, which they didn't, because he said, you're going to all bow down to me, right? That made them mad and they got rid of him. But he, he had the dream of rulership at home. So they kicked him out of home. So he has rulership in Potiphar's house. She lies. Kicks him out of the house. He goes to the prison. And he has even rulership there. You, no matter where Joseph goes, the man is destined to rule and reign. That's what I'm going to Don't wait for God. Well, one day I'll rule and reign. When I get to this, th this much money, or if I have this kind of a church, or if I have this kind of responsibility, I'll no, you rule and reign everywhere. If you're unemployed, you rule and reign. If you're, if you're in jail, is he in jail? You rule and reign. See, what's this deal about, oh, well, I'm in jail. I, I'm, I'm just some scum of the earth now. I, I can't do nothing. You rule and reign where you are. It doesn't matter where you're at, what happens to you. You rule and reign. Are you getting that? You get the, you get, all right. So he, he's ruling and reigning in the prison. He gets in charge of everything in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge. Because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper or succeed. There he's going to prosper in prison. You can't, everywhere you go, you're going to prosper. Because the favor of God is on you. The call of God is on you. That's the core person of who you are, is God. Okay, now read on. Chapter 41, verse 37. So Joseph is in prison, and Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man... Um, well, first of all, he interprets the dream. I skipped a whole lot there because I don't have time to develop it. But you know the story. He interprets a dream. And Pharaoh says, well, what guy can help us with these seven years of famine that's coming? That's what Pharaoh says here in verse 37. Can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? And Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there's no one discerning like you. So you're wise. You shall be over my house. 
and all my people shall order themselves as you what? Command. Now he is in charge of the nation. In charge of a man's house. That didn't go well. He got dethroned. And now, but he's in charge of a prison. And then he's in charge of a nation. Second in command of the whole. He went in there as a slave. Did he not? Rags to riches. But he ruled and reigned in rags. And he'll rule and reign in riches because it's not the rags or riches. It's the call of God in his life that is to rule and reign. Now, if you don't understand, that's your call. That's in your DNA right now as you sit there. It is in your DNA to rule and reign. Somewhere, someone, somehow. Cities, nations, households, goods. Okay? See that? Now, what I want you to see... Um, Pharaoh gives Joseph at this time a signet ring. And what a signet ring is, it carries the highest authority in the land and empowers the subordinates to act for the king as the king. And Joseph gets the signet ring. And the church in this world should be ruling and reigning the way that Joseph did, and the result being success and prosperity in whatever we're called to do, affecting our world. Again, on earth as it is in heaven. Now, in Genesis 49, 8, you're already in Genesis, you might as well turn there. Chapter 49, verse 8. And Jacob is giving out the blessing to, the 12, um, to his 12 sons, 12 tribes of Israel. And what I want you in particular to see is verse 8, Judah. What blessing just does Judah get? Your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who, dare, who dares rouse him? Look at this part here. Here's what I want you to see. The scepter shall not depart from this man, Judah. Remember Joseph got the signet ring? Well, Judah gets the scepter. All right? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. So he gets scepter and rulership. And that's what you do with a scepter. You rule and reign with a scepter, right? Now, who comes... From the tribe of Judah. Jesus. Right? So everybody in the from Judah, who is the um, head of that tribe, everybody born in that tribe from here on out gets scepter and rulership. And that's why the kings were all from Judah. A king couldn't be from any other place but Judah. But then they the divided, Rehoboam came in there and divided and took ten tribes one way and took two tribes the other, and Israel got split. Okay, that's where you get Israel, and then you have Jews. Judah took Benjamin, went one way with the Levites, and the rest of the tribe went somewhere else. See, not all Jews, not all Israelites are Jews, but all Jews are Israelites. All right, that's just a little thing there. But I want you to see, Jesus comes from Judah, which means he gets the scepter. He gets the rulership. So it makes sense now when you look at Isaiah 9, 6, and listen to what Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Talking about Jesus. And the government. What's, the gov what's, the, what's going to happen? The government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now watch this. The government shall rest on his shoulders, and there'll be, and of the increase of his kingdom... There is no end. His kingdom. See, at this point, it's in preparation mode. From, from Genesis to Malachi, the kingdom is in preparation mode. Israel gets to be the ones that's going to give birth to the Messiah who will establish the kingdom when he comes. Right? Because Jesus has to, the scepter and the ruler has to, the Messiah has to be born. The king, the kingdom has to have a king. That's why it's in preparation mode from Genesis to Malachi. Make sense? So Israel gets to birth the Messiah. Right? They get to, they're in the preparation mode. They're not the kingdom. 
The kingdom doesn't come till Jesus comes because he's the king. God will treat them like a kingdom from heaven, but then God comes from heaven on earth and establishes the kingdom down here through people by the born again experience. John 3, Nicodemus, you cannot enter the kingdom unless you're born again. He says you can't enter in and you can't even see it unless you're born again. And so the kingdom of God is by birth, new birth. All right. So look at Luke 1, 31. No, don't turn there. I'll, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, still talking about Jesus in the, in the rulership, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. This is what he's saying to Mary. And he shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Now what do you do from a throne? You rule. So you've got a throne, the place of rulership, you've got a scepter, and you've got the gift from the line of the tribe of Judah of rulership. And that's what Jesus is doing. Not of this world, though. Remember, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. Okay? So he's not going to rule and reign like a president or prime minister or a pharaoh would. But that's what they thought. Looking up here to the board, that's what Israel thought. They thought in the preparation mode that when the Messiah would come, he would set up a literal kingdom. And they got ticked off that he was going to die. What do you mean die? We're under Rome occupation. We thought you was going to liberate us from foreign armies and foreign control. And liberate us, liber, liberate us back into, you know, sovereignty. And, and, and so they, they didn't have anything to do with some other kingdom. Pilate says, you know, he, he told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. So what is this throne that has been, given to, has been given to Jesus, the throne of David, is rulership, but not a physical rulership, but a spiritual kingdom. And where is that kingdom at? In you. That throne is in you, where God dwells now. He who is joined the Lord is one spirit, John 14, 23, when the, Father, when the Spirit comes, we'll make our abode in you. That's why you become, according to 1 Corinthians 3, the temple of the Holy Spirit, not that you don't put tattoos and smoke and do that. That's not what that means. That means that you are the dwelling place of God where the rulership and the rule comes forth into this world. God has to rule and reign in this world. How? Through you. He can't rule from the heavens anymore like he did in the Old Testament. That was in the preparation mode. We're no longer in the preparation mode. Christ came, established the kingdom, and now it's advancing on this earth through you and I. And Revelation 1.6 says, To him, Jesus, be glory and dominion. How long? For a thousand years? Forever. That means the increase of his government goes on and on and on. And what you see here on this board is the evolution, if you will, of the kingdom of God. In preparation mode, in establishing mode, where we're ruling and reigning as the church, and to the consummation where all things, new heavens and new earth, eventually all the new like on a gerbil wheel. This thing goes on and on and on forever. It has an ending. All right? Now, are you... Are you, you you, get, you, you understand about your, you are destined. It's in your DNA to rule and reign. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And look at these verses differently. You're going to see these verses in a different light than what you would normally see. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 1. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust? And not before the saints? What's he saying? He's saying, you think you got ripped off by this guy, and now you're going to go to the physical courts, you're taking him to court, and you're suing him. And Paul says, I don't get that. Now, why, Paul? Well, am I not allowed to take this guy to court and sue him? You know, yeah, he's, a, he's, he's, he's supposed to be. I mean, how many Christians have you been screwed by? Huh? Yeah. I got, I, I mean, I just like... Do I have a sign on my back and say, hey, I'm a Christian looking for other Christians to put it to me? So Paul says, dare any of you having a matter against another go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints? In other words, don't go to the courts. Go before God's people and let them decide. That is never going to happen. I'm going to tell you that right now, and that ought to tell you the maturity of the church. So let's say Joe's got something against Daniel, and Joe thinks he's 100% right. And Daniel thinks he's 100% right. 
You may entertain it bringing it before the leaders, but the minute you aren't going to get your way, screw this. I knew they wouldn't, they wouldn't judge right. I'm still taking the court. You know that would happen today. Most, it's not, you, you're not going to take your matters to the leadership of the church. Because you, you may if you think you're going to win. But the loser's going to say, nah, I quit. I ain't doing this. And you go take him before a magistrate or something, right? Paul says, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust? Now, why has Paul, Paul got this mentality? Where does this mindset come from? He says, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? Now, let's take the word judge out because you could easily transcribe that to mean or translate that to mean rule. Now, let's read. Let's take the word judge out and read this passage with the word rule. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that saints shall rule the world? And if the world shall be ruled by you, are you unworthy to rule the smallest matters? Now you know what they're going to do with this. When am I going to rule the world? In the millennium. Well then why are you giving me rulership now over saints? See, in the millennium I'll have my glorified body. Huh? I'll, have, I'll know all things. Of course, in the millennium, I'll, I'll be able to rule because I'll be able to rule with wisdom, righteousness, and, and, and judge, make good judgments in, in, in that period of time. But I'm not that man today as I would be in the millennium. So, Paul, that makes no sense. I'm a moron right now. I'm a, I'm a flat-out naive idiot. And, and, but over there in the millennium, I'll, I'll, have some, I'll have the ability to rule and reign. So, do you understand the, 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 the conflict here that I have with this? Is that so I'm ruling and reigning over there, you know, just like Jesus. But over here, I'm an idiot. I don't know all things. I don't know what's in his heart to be able to make a judgment for him against him. How is that, Paul? That makes no sense. I, I would say that's, that's a lame argument, isn't it? You're looking at me. Maybe am, am I not am I, am not am not am I not sharing this right? No, you're, you're I mean, if I'm smart now, yeah, let me rule matters, because I'll be ruling them over in the millennium, because I'll be the same here as in, over there. But I'm not the same here as I would be over there in Utopia. Over there, I'm perfect. Over here, I'm imperfect. So he's saying I'll judge the world in a perfect state over there. So in my imperfect state. Come to me with your disputes. You're like, hell no. You're imperfect. You're a moron. You have no clue what the, you know. We, we've got we got a dispute over an engine matter, and you're not even a mechanic. How are you going to rule for me? So he's not talking about a millennium. You can't take this and throw it over into some age to come that really doesn't even exist. It just robs us. Now watch. So he says here, do you not know that you're going to rule? Saints will rule the world. And if the world shall be ruled by you, are you unworthy to rule the smallest matters? N know ye not that we shall rule angels. Get rid of the word judge. Because the judge has to do with throne, right? Throne has to do with rulership. Start thinking, how do I rule an angel? I don't tell angels what to do. How much more things that pertain to this life? If you're going to rule angels, how much more things that pertain to this life? So he's saying you're ruling in the spirit realm right now. How much more should you be, you be able to rule in the physical realm? That's what he's saying right there. Now how do I rule an angel? I don't talk to angels. I don't really, I don't, I don't get into the to, to, to stuff like, I'm going, to dispatch, I'm going to dispatch my angel over there to do this, that, or the other. I'm not concerned about where, where angels go, okay? So then how am I ruling angels? It says here, so Greg, that has to be over there in the millennium because you're not ruling. Here's how I rule angels today. If God tells me to do something, I'm going to do it, and the angels have to respond because I'm doing God's will. If God says, speak this word, when I speak that word, I'm not concerned, okay, angels, go. I'm concerned with speaking what he tells me to speak. And the minute that I speak it, the angels are dispatched. So I rule angels and not even know it. But Paul knew it, and we should know it too. If you don't think that your words are putting or dispatching angels, if you're speaking God's word, 
If you're not speaking God's word and doing God's you know, bidding, occupying, doing the Father's business, the angels ain't going to help you go do some crazy thing that God ain't in. Right? Now, I don't know what that does to you, but that ought to reveal to you that, hey, man, are we ruling? We're not, he says, if you, you're ruling in the spirit realm, how much more should you be able to rule about things that pertain to this life? Now, but you say, Greg, it says, shall judge. It says, you shall judge the world like it's supposed to come. Well, in John chapter 5, verse 25, you need to turn there because this, this putting stuff always in the future messes you up. Now, Jesus said in John 5, 25, somebody read that because I don't have it written down here. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming. Okay? Now, that means future, doesn't it? The hour is coming, right? Mm -hmm. Then what's he say? The hour is coming and now is. Which is it? Is it coming or is it now is? I mean, I call you on the phone. Where are you at, Greg? I'm coming. Where are you at? I'm here. Wait a minute. Are you coming or are you here? I'm in the house. I'm here, but I'm coming. Come on, Jesus. That's, that's the way the Bible talks, and you've got to understand. But here's the thing. The kingdom is now, which is right here, from Jesus to the end, the kingdom is now. But it is also going to consummate, so it's still coming. So the kingdom is coming, but now is. So I don't know what kind of rulership you're going to have over here, and I don't really care. And I'm going to tell you why I don't care in a minute. What I care about is the kingdom now, not the kingdom to come. End time prophecy is all about kingdom coming, not kingdom now. They, they got you looking at an antichrist. They got you looking at a seven-year tribulation. They got you looking at a rapture. They got you looking at a second coming. They got you looking at a battle of Armageddon. They got you looking at the resurrections. They got you looking at all kinds of things, right? But what about now? People are so consumed and obsessed with the kingdom to come. And Jesus says in Luke, I don't know, what, what, I don't know where it's at now. If somebody knows, you can tell me. But somewhere in Luke, he says, occupy till I come. In other words, be occupied. Occupy means do business. Whose business are you supposed to be involved in? God's business. Jesus said it. I'm about my Father's business. So occupy, Jesus saying to the church, do the Father's business. Occupy till I come, but don't be occupied with my coming. Be about the Father's business. And then so when the disciples said to Jesus in Acts 1 before he goes up into heaven, is this time, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom back to Israel? He wouldn't even, he says, no, it's not for you to know. It is not for you to know about the kingdom to come. So why is it that we spend so much time about figuring out when the kingdom is coming? When he says right there, it's not for you to know. So why are these end time preachers dealing so much with end times, when Jesus told us, it's not for me to know. And yet you will buy the books on the millennium. We'll buy the books on the rapture. We'll buy the books on the seven-year tribulation. Who's the Antichrist? You know, back in, in World War II, there was a preacher who had proved beyond a shadow of a doubt in his mind, and the publishers, that Mussolini was the Antichrist. So while the books were being published... Being boxed, ready to ship out, he gets assassinated. What are you going to do with all these books? Huh? Do you remember the desert storm under the first George Bush? Huh? David Wilkerson said that, oh my God, Russia is going to parachute their troops down here while all our troops are over there. John Hagee said up at the Hallelujah Barn back in the 90s when he was up here that, oh, there's going to be mass body bags. Uh, America is sending mass body bags and they're going to all come back. This is going to, this is doom and gloom. And I'm telling you, we were successful. Did you see one Russia get parachuted in America? And then we got 1988. 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back, huh? Remember that one? And there were churches that actually preached that and believed it. I didn't. Or the year 2000. Oh my God, 2000, the millennium, the new millennium. Get water, get, get food. And the church fell hook, line. Did anything happen? 
My computer still worked. Computers were going, no water. Computers were going to go. See, we're, this doomsday end time stuff is going on and on and on. Now, if you watch TBN, they play class, classics, which is like from 1982, 83, 84. Paul Crouch is interviewing all these people like Pat Robertson, John Hagee, Pat B Benny Hinn, all these guys in the 80s. And when the end time preachers come on, because I watch it. I, wa I tape it. I, I just want to see what, what they used to say back then. Because I watched it back then. I worked for Christian television. And um, it's so funny when you watch the end time guys in the 80s. Because this is the kind of stuff Ronald Reagan was, you know, we had Star Wars, all that stuff happening. And these guys were saying, oh boy, the end is right around the corner. And this is like 1986. And he says, oh... Wait till 1988. Man, two years, Paul. Two years, something's going to happen. I remember I was at Fishnet and Pat Robertson said in 1982, I even got the cassette of some terrible thing that's going to happen between Iran and Iraq concerning America. Never happened. But boy, did he put the fear in that crowd that night. Nothing. And these guys never come back and repent and said, hey, I was wrong. They act like they never said anything. And they'll go on a year from now and start barking other crap down this pipe that doesn't make any sense. Are you, so then, then 1998 was one. Then the year 2000, new, but Paul, we're, we will not be here after 2010. Well, I don't know what is it now, 2013, I'm still here. I want you to watch this stuff, seriously. It is comical. And I'm like, why are you guys playing this? You make yourselves look bad. You literally make yourself look bad. Chuck Smith, I didn't know this, from California, prophesied two times an actual date of the Lord's return. Never happened. Calvary Chapel. So I'm just like, when are we going to wake up that Jesus said to us, you will not know the times and the sea. It's not for you to know. And you know what we do? We keep dabbling into it. You know why? We're occupied with His coming, the kingdom to come, but we're not occupied with the kingdom now. And therefore, there's your disconnect. We're not ruling and reigning because we're throwing into a millennium. It's never going to happen. Now let me ask you this question. How many have been to a funeral home? I've probably been there more than you because I bury as well as marry people. And I want you to understand that when you go to a funeral home, do you go into the, do you, does it ever dawn on you to walk into the office, sit down and talk about your death? Hey, I want to, I want to talk, I'm, I'm here for this guy, he's dead, but I need to, I need to make arrangements for me. <laughs> do you, does it even dawn on you to do that? I mean, you know, do, do, you, do you walk by that office and go, oh, I got to go in there someday. Maybe the next guy dies. I'll, or I'm, I had to make an appointment. Hey, I, you know, I'll be back. You don't. It doesn't even. It doesn't even dawn on you to go in that office and make your your arrangements for death. Why? Because you're occupied with living, yeah. not with death. If you're occupied with death, look at some of the choices you're going to make. You're not going to go on vacation this year. Why? I could die. I gotta save my money for my funeral plot. I, I mean, it costs money to be buried nowadays. I can't afford vacation because I might die. Or, go, you know, kid gets out of high school. You gonna go to college? No, man. I don't. I, I mean, I might. I may be dead in, in a week. I can't make future plans when I could be dead. Now that's a person obsessed. You gonna get married? No, she might die. Why well, get married? No, she might die next week. Right? I mean, that's a fear of death. You'll make no decisions if you're occupied with your death. You won't have a life if you're occupied with your death. Right? It's the same principle. If you're occupied with his kingdom to come, like all these end time guys are, you won't occupy till he comes, which is do the Father's business, which is what? Ruling and reigning in this life. That's Luke 19.13. Luke 19.13. That's that occupy. Luke 19.13. So does that make sense? Now let me, let, me, let me just close with this. God's looking down from heaven on this earth. And there are two groups of people, saved and unsaved. Right? And right now the unsaved are ruling this earth. Whether it's capitalism, socialism, um, communism, people are over this. You know, we're the, it's, the, it's the unsaved that's legislating. It's the unsaved making decisions. And the saved just actually just sit by doing nothing.
Now, so you've got two groups of people. You've got saved people and you've got unsaved people. And the Bible says in Psalms, the heavens is the earth, but the, the, the heavens is God's, but the earth he's given to who? The son of man, the children of men. So God's given the earth to men. Who do you think he wants to endorse down here? Who do you think he should be ruling and reigning through? The unsaved or the saved? Of course it's the saved. And yet it's not happening because we don't know who we are. And when you look at your own individual life and you, and you get to the point where I can't even pay my bills at the end of the month, you don't know who you are. Do you remember the story I told you last week? Did I tell the story last week about the guy that God said, I, I want you to come up with 7000 yeah. bucks? Yeah. I tell you that. Or for, I got some new people here. But um, God says to this, this pastor in Delaware, he says, I want you to come up with $7,000. I don't want you to take an offering. I don't want you to ask anybody for it. Flat out. Don't, you, you, I, need, I need you to come up with $7,000. He says, God, I, I don't know what I'm, how am I supposed to do that? I mean, you've just completely um, cut me off from every possible ways and means that I can come up with to make that money. And God says, I want you to create it. I want you to create it. Call those things that are not as though they were. Use the principles that, I, that Jesus gave us about speaking to mountains and all that that we've talked about for weeks past. He goes, I want you to create it. He said he had it in 36 hours. Boom, it came. Don't know how was, Okay, now what am I supposed to do with it? He didn't know what the need was for. A couple days later, within the week, he saw the need, and he sowed the money where it was supposed to go. But he said, that, and so he's, he's learning this. He's learning. So, you know, we have to somehow get this in our spirits that, look, what's it mean to rule and reign? I am owner and ruler of his goods. I'm not there yet. This I'm preaching to me. Okay? I mean, one of the things about this kind of... See, when I was in my 20s, you got to understand something. When I was in my 20s, I would go to the Old Testament, the Isaiah, the, the major prophets, the minor prophets, and I'd find awesome scriptures that I'd want to say, Oh, yeah! I'd go to my commentary, and guess what they'd say to me? That's for Israel. Everything in the book of Isaiah is for Israel. And I'm like, I can't have that. That can't happen. That won't happen. So I'm, I, I'm just naive. So I start marking my Bible up because I'm like, okay, then what's for the church? What's for me? If this is for Israel in the millennium, what's for me? So I'm going through there. And so I'm like, I'm, okay, I don't know. Should I even be reading any of these prophets, any of these minor prophets? Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, Joel, Amos. Is any of these? I'd, and I'd find these promises and every stinking time I'd go to a commentary, that's for Israel in the millennium. And then the experiences in the Old Testament, that's for the millennium. If the promises weren't for Israel, the experiences were for the millennium. What the hell do I get? Well, as a church, what do I get? I'm not being funny. I'm serious. Yeah, I was frustrated. I'm like, what do I get? I don't, I don't understand this. I'm just supposed to witness? I... I mean, then I've got this certain sects of people saying to me that uh, tongues ain't for today, healing ain't for today, signs and wonders ain't for today, miracles ain't for today. So I've got people on this end telling me the signs and wonders and miracles aren't for today. I've got these people telling me that the promises are for Israel and these experiences are for the millennium. I'm like, I don't even know what's for me then. No wonder I'm defeated and poor and, and just a bum in, in, in this world because I don't know who I am. They've robbed me from my identity. My identity's in that Bible, and they've given it to the to Israel and to the millennium, and I'm like, then where, where am I at? And you may have that same situation with that. Well, that's for Israel. So then, then, then I go to Paul, and Paul would say to me in 2 Corinthians 1:20, all the promises of God are yes to those in Christ Jesus. How many know that scripture? But the New Testament wasn't written yet. And Paul's talking to me, Gentile. So then Paul says to me, Greg, go to the Old Testament and all the promises are yes to you in Christ Jesus. And I'm like, I can't, Paul. Hal Lindsey says I'm not allowed to do that. John Hagee says that's for Israel. Paul says, Greg, go to the Old Testament. All the promises are yes to those in Christ Jesus. All the experiences can be yours today. Today's the day of deliverance. Today, today's the salvation. You can have it today. I'm like, I can't because my dispensationalist brother says it's for the millennia in Israel. And Paul keeps referring me to the Old Testament. They keep kicking me out. Now, who are you going to listen to? John Hagee or Apostle Paul? You going to listen to John Hagee tell you that Israel is relevant today? Or are you going to listen to the Apostle Paul and say there is no Israel today? 
one new man. There's no distinction. There's no Jew, and there's no, there's no American, there's no Israel, and there's no Arab, there's no Palestinian, one new man. And churches don't have that under their belt yet either. So I'm saying to you, we've, we, I have, I've been duped for all, most of my life about this kind of stuff. And no wonder I have no power to raise a wing on a gnat. Have you seen signs and wonders? Are you seeing people healed? You seeing people raised from the dead? Because that's the millennium. Great, that's for Israel. So I think what God's doing in these messages is awakening us to our destiny, to who we really are. We are carrying the presence of Jesus. We have the scepter, the signet ring's ours, and we should be living as kings and ruling and reigning in this life. Amen? Now, I don't know what you want to be occupied. Are you going to be preoccupied with his coming, the kingdom to come, or are you going to be preoccupied with the kingdom now and occupied till he comes? And it starts in your individual life. So Jesus said, and I wrote it down here, one last scripture and I'm done. Turn, turn with me to John chapter 12. you got to see this scripture. Because this is going to give you the faith for today's message, should at least. John 12, 31. Jesus is speaking. Okay? See, at the end, you know, at that thousand year period, it says Satan's supposed to be bound for the thousand years. Jesus um, bound the strong man at the cross. So he's already bound. Right? Why would we wait for the thousand years to come to bind, for, for an angel to bind Satan when Jesus, through the cross, was supposed to have bound him? And, and he says, now plunder his goods. He shall no longer deceive the nations. The gospel is going to go around the world. Now watch this. Look at verse 31. Now, not when, not then, not the millennium. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world, what? Now. Now. Not some millennial reign. Now he's cast out. Now you have all power and authority over him, and it starts in your own individual life. Over addictions, over depression, over whatever it is in your life that you're struggling with, the evil one's been cast out. There is no, you have all power over yourself. You've been restored the power. And out of oneness, you rule and reign. And if, if you can't rule and reign your own life, you're going to find it difficult to rule and reign out there. Now, you know, not that you're going to be able to rule and reign every... That's being legalistic, that you've got to rule and reign every aspect of your life. But if you start getting in the mode of being a ruler, and you start ruling within your life, and ruling outside, you'll get more outside, you'll get more inside, and you're on this progression of becoming a ruler over a household, maybe then promoted to a city, promoted over a nation. I think, I think the churches ought to be able to sway a city. And the whole church of Jesus Christ ought to be able to sway the world. Jesus did it. One man. One man. And look what he did in those three and a half years. And we are a church, a many-membered body. And we can't do anything because we look, keep looking. Because you know why? We don't know our identity. And we keep looking for the government and other people to do it when it's within us. The power is within us to take control of our lives and our environment and everything around about us. So start getting the mindset of a ruler. And so now maybe the scripture might make sense to you when he says, you are the head only and not the tail. You, you are above only and never beneath. That means wherever the sole of your foot treads, God's given it to you. And therefore, wherever you are, walk in that church. Walk in, not the church. I'm, I'm the head here. You can't do that here. Walk in your business as the head. Not the boss. You're the head. He's the, he's the boss of the physical realm of that business, but you're the head of the spiritual realm of that business. In fact, God sways that man's heart because the, the heart of that man is in God's hand to sway. So really, you're the, would you rather rule physically over that man or rule spiritually over that man? You want his real estate or do you want the whole atmosphere that affects the real estate? Huh? 
Listen, wherever you go, see your... What? I mean, that's not arrogance. That's what people... Well, that's being arrogant. No. Then Jesus was the most arrogant man in the world because he, everywhere he went, he was the head, not the tail. He was always above everybody and not beneath. When they even tried to kill him, that ain't going to happen. You realize when the police went to go take custody, they're knocking on his door, they got the handcuffs, and he says, not now. Oh, oh, oh. They go back, where's he at? We sent you to get him. I don't know. He said something. We just, we didn't know. We just stood there. We were paralyzed. You go get him. He called the shots, man. Because he was a man on a mission. What? He was occupying till he went. We occupy till he comes. He's going to occupy till he goes. He wasn't concerned with his death till he got there. He was concerned with healing the sick, raising the dead, doing all that he did. And he says, my time is not now. So, come back later. And then when Peter tried to protect him, when they did finally get him and um, put him under arrest, Peter took the sword and tried to cut off one of those guys' ears. And he put it back on and said, Peter... Do you realize I could call down a, a, a legion of angels and God would, my Father would deliver me right now? Yeah. They're not taking my life. I am giving my life. So he even, he even allowed them to kill him. He didn't have to. He had power to say no to that. But he said, I lay down. No man takes my life. I lay it down. I'm telling you, no man takes your life and no sickness takes your life. Fear will let cancer in. Fear will let the heart attack happen. And if you've got the authority to say, nothing has taken me out until the Lord and me are ready to go. No man, I, no man takes my life. No sickness takes my life. See, that's the militancy that's missing in the body of Christ today. Is it not? you got, you, you got um, what do they call those people that you, you owe money to? Collectors? You got collectors? Does that not tick you off? Getting bullied by collectors and phone calls and all that? You need to say it stops today. Now there's something happening in your spirit. When something in you says, that's over. I'm done. I am not, I am not subject to this kind of bullying. And yeah, I may owe it, but I don't need to be bullied into paying it. And I'm saying, you know what? Why can't I pay it? That's the problem. Why? And it stops today. I'm creating wealth. I'm speaking that this, because I am who I am. Now, you sit there and think, ah, okay, then you know what? How is your government taking care of you? Has it been working out for you? You can't even get on the stinking website to get your health care. How's that working out for you? They take your, your, your policy, they cancel it to send you here that you can't even get on to see what you could get. How is, and it's, it's not Obama, it's every government. Because they're not the answer. Christ. Somewhere along the lines, I thought I heard Christ is the answer. Did you hear that somewhere? Let's stand. Yes. Isaiah 60 says, Arise and shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Even though there's darkness covering the earth, gross darkness to people, it says, but the Lord will arise on you and his glory will be seen upon you and the lost shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your glory. Kings will come to you because the rulership, you've got the scepter. They don't. Kings don't go to subordinates. Kings go to those when they recognize they're kings over kings. And is not Jesus the king of kings? Man, we don't know who we are. Father God, open our eyes to this. Kings are going to come to the brightness of our rising. Because the glory of the Lord is on us. Because we're one with the Father. And out of that oneness, we are who we are. He's the head, but we're the body. Christ has called us to occupy. Do the Father's business on earth as it is in heaven. And we are the vehicle to advance God's kingdom. Open our eyes, Lord. And with you, just, just, just listen to me. You don't have to look up or nothing. Just listen. You, you're not going to be accepted as a ruler in a lot of places. Joseph wasn't accepted as a ruler in his own house. They kicked him out. Joseph wasn't accepted as a ruler in, in Potiphar's house. The wife 
interfered there and kicked him out. And the two guys in the, in the jail, the one guy forgot him. Joseph was so, so irrelevant to that guy he helped that when he went to the king, he forgot about Joseph. So really, yeah, there you go, Joseph. Some, there are going to be places you're not going to be respected as a king, as a ruler. But don't get disheartened because Jesus said, if you go to a, a workplace or you go to a home, you have some friends, and they don't recognize your kingship, and it's to bless other people, by the way, not to rule over them. It's to, to, to rule in order to bless. If you're not a blessing to people, you're not ruling right. If you're a thorn in somebody's side, you ain't ruling right. You ought to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Jesus said, just wipe the dust off your pant legs. Move on somewhere else where you'll be respected and received as a king. There's too many places that need us that we got to worry about those over there. They said to Jesus, that, that city doesn't want us. Should we rain fire down from heaven? He said, no, no, man. We'll, go to, we'll go somewhere else. So if you're not being accepted where you're at, there is a place where they'll let you rule. They're looking for you. Kings will rise to the brightness of your shining. Sons and daughters will come to you. Not everybody's going to recognize your ability to rule, and that's okay. But it doesn't keep you from ruling. Joseph ruled, in, ruled from one place to another place. Don't let the world tell you you're not a ruler, or we don't need you, we don't want you. Or your past is a bad past, and you don't get to rule because you blew it. No. Justification is no one blew nothing. God's doing a new thing in a new day. Everybody gets a clear, clean shot. His mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The gift of righteousness gives you the ability to rule. That alone. Not man and not the church. God gives you the right to rule. If they don't accept you, you go somewhere else. You're in a church they don't accept you, go somewhere else. But Father, we just receive the ability because we all have the ability to receive this word this morning and we receive it by faith. Open eyes this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.